basically you know, from all over the world, uh, which is great. So uh, these are the agenda uh, for uh, this meetup. So uh, we are going to be starting uh, uh, with the uh, brief outlook about uh, open, so, uh, open mainframe project, uh, which is delivered by uh, John Mertic. Uh, uh, he is the uh, director of uh, Open Mainframe Project at the Linux Foundation. And then uh, we uh, you know that the uh, brief uh, uh, outlook will uh, probably uh, continue uh, 25 minutes. Uh, then uh, we gonna, we're gonna take a five minutes uh, break or a question time. Then we are going to move, uh, to, move to Zoe, uh, uh, Zoe presentation. And Zoe presentation will be uh, uh, delivered by uh, Yakub Bolhar from Broadcom. And then uh, again, no, we're gonna, we're gonna take a five, five minutes break or a question time. Then we are going to move toward the uh, discussion about the Linux and open source on uh, IBM Z and uh, Linux One which is uh, uh, delivered by uh, Micah Friesenger, Friesenegger uh, from today. Then the, uh, our final uh, uh, topic is going to be discussing uh, about the future uh, with COBOL, uh, which is uh, uh, discuss, uh, discussed by three uh, people, uh, 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 Suhara, Suharasana uh, from IBM and Dave from, uh, 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 he, he's the uh, TSC chairperson of COBOL, and then uh, Cameron from uh, East Carolina University. So uh, without further ado, uh, I, would like, uh, I would like to uh, invite John uh, to uh, talk about the uh, outlook about open source mainframe and uh, open, uh, open mainframe project overview. Okay, so uh, John, please uh, take it over. Awesome, thank you so much, Nori. Um, and thank you all uh, for spending um, time with us and learning more about the Open Mainframe Project. Uh, as Nori mentioned, uh, my name is John Mertik. I am the director of the Open Mainframe Project on behalf of the Linux Foundation. And to give you an overview of the Open Mainframe Project, uh, I want to set the stage thinking about where forward thinking enterprises are going. And more and more, as I talk to um, companies that we work with, and this is globally, they all are thinking hybrid. And when I say hybrid, they're thinking of their computing infrastructure and their technology choices. They're not buying from one vendor. They're not going with one um, you know, canonical stack. Um, they're picking a lot of different pieces as they see that is a huge strategy for them going forward to better engage their customer, to better execute it as a business. And they actually see it as a competitive advantage. So. I want to set the stage a little bit with that and then just talk about the Open Mainframe project and how this all comes together. So to help kick that off, I want to give a brief history of computing infrastructure. And I, and I stress this as brief. Um, I'm going to miss a lot of things and it's intentional. We only have so much time. But I want to kind of give you a little bit of the backstory of, of really how we got here. And to get there, you have to go backwards. And where we really started seeing um, computing infrastructure and businesses start to take fold is in the 1960s. Um, and you know, up and through the mid 2000s, we saw a pattern of organizations predominantly relying on a physical infrastructure that's under their roof, that they're owning, that they're driving. Um, and they would often go with one vendor to do that. They would go, they would make a purchase, um, they would contact a vendor, they'd make a purchase. And with that, you often even saw a lot of safe choices. Um, you know, there's very funny sayings about many vendors of that era that, you know, nobody would get fired for buying from a certain vendor or not. Um, but that was sort of the pattern. And once you sort of went down that ecosystem, that's the way you went. Um, the downside, what, we've, what was in that era, is you saw the evolution of these was a lot slower than we see today. And there's one part about it is, um, the access to hardware. I mean, this hardware is extremely expensive. It was very hard to get time on. Um, but the other part, you had an industry that was maturing at the same time. And as this industry started to mature, you know, and we've seen this shift over the last two decades, we've seen the infrastructure evolve at the same time. And so if we start back in the 2000s with that same non virtualized hardware and start to move forward, you know, then we come to virtualization, which was just a huge thing back in the early 2000s. I remember that was the early part of my career. 
and seeing that start to come hold and being able to take a server that might be sitting idle most of the time and use it, you know, and, and use it in a whole bunch of different ways was just mind blowing. Um, and then that just ball started to roll. We saw Amazon Web Services come through and um, Heroku and OpenStack as we saw the infrastructure and, and um, infrastructure of a service and platform as a service take off Cloud Foundry. And then from there, we even saw it go a, a level deeper with containerizations. And now we're at an area with cloud native. Um, and, you know, we could go a deep talk into this, especially if we were, you know, doing a talk on Kubernetes. But the real moral of the story here is that technology shifted from the business having to adapt to it. Now, the technology adapts to the business. And that has enabled organizations to look at their infrastructure in a whole different way. They can be very dynamic about it. They can be fluid with it. They can, you know, choose a lot of different computing um, styles and resources. You know, maybe it's a cloud deployment. Maybe it's on-premise servers. Maybe it's edge computing. Um, all sorts of different things pieced together, um, especially as the application deployment methodology went away from being monolithic stacks to microservices. All these nodes are very interconnected. And if you look at what the one connective thread between all of this is, it's open source. So what about Mainframe? Mainframe has been a platform that's existed throughout this entire time. And what's really unique about Mainframe is its design principles. It's probably one of the few platforms out there that actually comes to mind with just design principles that had been adhered to for decades. And the four ones that you'll see the Mainframe adhere to, and these are the same ones since the first mainframes, you know, the first of the current generation mainframes rolling off the, the line in the early 60s, and even before that in earlier generations, security, availability, scalability, and performance. Those are the four design principles behind the mainframe. And most importantly, all of these design principles were turned up to an 11. Um, these was everything that the mainframe was designed around was maximizing all four of these vectors at the exact same time. How do we create the most secure box with the highest level of availability, a box that doesn't go down, a box that's infinitely scalable, and a box that has the fastest performance on the market? And you know, the reality is, is a lot of businesses don't need this for every single one of their applications. But the ones that do need this for parts of their applications, it's super critical. You know, think the airline industry, think finance, think healthcare, all of those areas where the transaction loads are extremely high. And it's extremely important to have these services up, available, secure, and performant. Mainframe's the architecture that can do it. So if we sort of take a step back here, as we think about mainframe and how it can interconnect with all of this, how does that happen? What is the piece that makes this happen? What is that connective thread? And we already touched on it. It's open source. That's the connective thread that if you look at every single piece of infrastructure in our DevOps-centric world, open source is that thread. And this is really where the Open Mainframe project comes in. And as I talk with project members, they all really agree on these tenets here of belief. They believe that these leading organizations out there are, just as I said, they leverage the technology infrastructure as a competitive advantage. They believe on these design principles are important to all of these organizations. And having the mainframe interconnected in this enables all of these organizations that are leading and forward thinking to recognize all of its benefits. And most importantly, why the need for a foundation, why the need for a project like this is because they believe this can only be achieved. It's not a vendor specific problem. It's not a customer specific problem. It can only be achieved as a community through open source. And that's really what the mission of this whole project is. Build community adoption of open source in the mainframe and through four different vectors. One is eliminating those barriers to open source adoption of the mainframe demonstrating the value of the mainframe of both technical and business levels, strengthening those collaboration points within the community so they can thrive, 
in identifying, accepting, and hosting those projects and technical efforts that are consistent in advance towards recognizing that larger vision. So that's what the Open Mainframe Project is here to do. And through that, it's enabled amazing in, in innovation. And here is the number of projects here that are part of the Open Mainframe Project today. Um, and they're all over the map. You know, they're impacting the Linux on Z world, they're impacting the ZOS world, the COBOL world. And we're going to learn a little bit more about this later in this presentation here. Um, and you can also learn about it on our website as well. And if you are familiar with the Linux Foundation and some of the work we do, you'll know that it's not just about enabling in innovation, it's about sustainably enabling this innovation. And this is a slide you might have seen before, but it really speaks to the circle of how projects at the Open Mainframe Project and even broader at the Linux Foundation work. We invest in projects, we invest in developer communities um, and support and help drive them forward. And the output of that goes into vendor products, that goes into end customers using it, it goes into um, other code. And the realization of what many people would call profits, but in more layman's terms, might be you know a reduced cost of R and D, a faster cost to market, not having to reinvent certain components. There's a monetary thing that's gained, and that pushes itself back into the project, and you see this cycle continuing on and on. A successful project like the Open Mainframe Project and the successful 18 technical efforts that we host here all depend on this full circle completing itself, and it depends on members, developers and that infrastructure to develop projects that lead to products that the market adopts. And you can look a little bit more, and I encourage you to look at on um, the open mainframe landscape as a great example of just understanding the breadth of what's going on here. This is a view here that just talks about the specific open source projects on the mainframe, along with the view of the Zoe conformance um, world. And so those are applications that have been built on top of Zoe um, and are conformant to the community specifications. And we'll learn a little bit more about that in, in talks uh, following mine here. Mm -hmm. And even more broadly, there's a large set of projects out here that are supporting the architecture. And this is, this is really important because from a technical aspect, there are differences between the S390 architecture, which is um, the chip architecture as referred to for the mainframe, you know, versus x86 or ARM or power. Um, and so there are uniquenesses to this that all of these open source projects we're seeing here not only can run on, but they also take advantage of, and they take advantage of some of those uniquenesses and powers um, throughout. So let's take a little bit of a look here at where we've seen this innovation happening within the project. And I wanna to touch first on Zoe. Zoe might be a project you've heard of. It's really been taking storm here over nearly the last three years. and the large challenge that was happening in the ZOS world was interconnecting the ZOS applications and services, which had a different integration pattern than what we'd see in typical programming languages today. You know, they didn't, you know, ZOS didn't have a lot of the concept of REST APIs and CLI interfaces and all these sort of things that as a developer today, you tend to depend on. Um, ZOS was just a little bit different and that was causing not only a talent gap, but it was also just causing a tooling gap. In 2018, Zoe came together as a project. It came together as a project between three different organizations, IBM, Rocket Software, um, and CA Technologies, as it was known now, now it's Broadcom. And within a year, they got to a 1.0 release and built a conformance program to really start to drive forward um, a lot of solutions in the downstream market and continuing investments in there. And we've seen this project become a huge focal point, not only for the mainframe world, but the DevOps world. 20,000 commits today, 200 plus committers all time, and a growing set of offerings here. And so this is based off of one project that has opened up open source development and really is the largest and really first open source project for the ZOS operating system. And it's really revolutionized how people are engaging with it. And like I said, we have a whole presentation coming up after mine. We'll dig more into it. So I won't spend a ton of time here. I do want to shift also talking about um, ZVM. And many of you might be familiar with the Linux on Z or um, Linux S390X, um, as it's often called as well. 
And Linux, as we all know, it's a it's a unifying tool across all of this landscape. That said, mainframe has some specific things that one can take advantage of. And one of the really strong points of the mainframe is its hypervisor of ZVM. And this was the preferred hypervisor that you're on a mainframe of using. And the challenge is, is that organizations wanted to make sure that how they were able to manage their mainframe and manage Linux on their mainframe was consistent across all the cloud technologies already in their organization. And there was efforts at this before, but a lot of them were very vendor driven, vendor owned. In 2019, it started bringing that into the open mainframe project with the first project being Phalong, soon followed by Tessia, and then earlier this year, Console Z. And all of this has brought a number of things, not only just new innovations, but it's bringing, we're, we're all three of these were relatively projects that were driven from one vendor. Now you have a multitude of vendors that are participating and driving these forwards. And you even see a degree of coordination that's starting to be early emerge. So this is a really exciting area. This is also a very early area, I would say. So this is something to keep a track on. And Mike Friesenager later will kind of dig a little bit more into this as well. And one other area I just really want to touch on here is COBOL. And COBOL is something that has hit all of our collective conscious over the last year. Um, here in the United States, it really hit strong in the depths of the COVID-19 pandemic, where it was quickly identified that many of the systems here in the US federal and state and local governments were built upon COBOL. And there was a concern that the maintenance of these systems was being underinvested in. Um, you know, there was a number of different state governments that um, even were, you know, pointing a finger at COBOL saying that it was the problem with some of their systems not keeping up. Probably the reality was that wasn't the case, but I think what was really important is it turned an eye to this is critical infrastructure and it's not legacy infrastructure, although it's been around many of it for decades, but it's infrastructure that is unique and it's infrastructure that is getting continuously invested in. And how can we help preserve and sustain this going forward? And this is really where the COBOL focus in the open mainframe project last year really kicked in. We launched a COBOL programming course as an open source project. So uh, an open source project that basically can teach people not just how to program in COBOL, but programming with COBOL with using the tools that you would natively want to use um, as a developer today, such as VS Code, for example. We created collaboration forums to try to create a focal point for this community to come together, especially around talent, because it was hard to identify some of this COBOL talent out there as some of these systems needed to be maintained. We further launched a working group that was bringing together those thought leaders and thinking about where the future is going. And earlier this year, we're starting to see some of those development practices that in today's modern languages, you would probably think is second nature, but COBOL got a little disconnected from it. And now we're starting to see these start to reemerge as these technologies in this uh, language is really being brought forward. And COBOL check is a really first step in that way, bringing test driven development practices to COBOL. And we've seen huge upticks. The, the forums have brought tons of people to them. The programming course has got tons of not only contributions, but people checking it out. And that course just continues to thrive. The working group is getting a lot of feedback and direction and participation from all facets. And we're starting to see the COBOL check for, uh, uh, project just get off the ground. And uh, we're gonna have a great presentation so we can dig into more of these later. So I don't wanna steal any thunder from that. One other thing I wanna touch on is uh, the mentorship aspect. And if there's one thing that's probably um, been an undercurrent through this whole conversation here, is the need to help bring more people into this ecosystem, um, especially with what, um, you know, there's a huge tenure of folks that have been in the mainframe industry for decades. And many of those people are getting, you know, towards the age out there, they're starting to get towards that retirement age. And how can we help bring that next generation to take part in all of this? So the mentorship program is something the Open Mainframe Project is actually getting ready um, to start here for its sixth year. And we've brought many, many students to this technology. We've, we've seen our students make tons of impacts upstream, um, including a port of a Linux uh, distribution to the mainframe, 
contributions to key open source projects, um, and also even some of our own projects. And these mentees have continued on in roles in many of our member companies. So it's helping sort of complete that circle and bring that next generation in. In addition to kind of all the technical work that's being done, which is really vast and there's a lot of things going on, the Open Mainframe project also looks to enable innovation through community building. And I think this is one of really the things I've always loved about the mainframe community is all communities are, are community centric, but I think the Open Main, the mainframe community itself is a very close knit community and helping strengthen those bonds but also being able to showcase a lot of what's going on in that community is really crucial to help take it to another decades to come. So let's look at a few of the programs we have going on there. And one of the first ones that we've been most proud of is our I Am A Mainframer podcast series. And this is a monthly interview series that focuses on the diversity in mainframe. So we've had uh, guests on here everybody from a student to Ross Morey, who's the GM of Mainframe for IBM, and everybody in between. And they're all talking about their stories. Why are they interested in Mainframe? Why have they spent their career in Mainframe? Why are they starting to get involved in Mainframe? What do they see for the future of this industry? What tips would they have for others that may be interested? It's really a fascinating series. I'd really encourage all of you, if you haven't, go subscribe to it, check it out. There's a ton to learn from here. There's a ton of great stories and it really helps give you a different perspective of what this industry is all about. We also focus on bringing a lot of this whole conversation together. And we do that not only just through the normal community collaborations through Slack and our forums and mailing lists, but we also hold an annual event. Um, and this event just get live um, this later September. It's a virtual event. Um, September 22nd and 23rd is our second year running of our Open Mainframe Summit. And this is an event that is focused on the intersection between open source and the mainframe. So if you walk away from today's conversation and think, wow, this is really an interesting space, this is an event you want to keep abreast of because this is one here that will start to deep dive into the great work that's happening, the technologies that are coming, the communities, the projects, and the people. Um, and we last year we did, and we had a huge, fantastic response. And so we're excited to run this again next year, or this later this year as a virtual event. In five years, the project launched itself in the summer of 2015. So we're actually almost getting closer to six years now. Um, we've seen a tremendous growth of this project from one project to 18, from a little over a dozen members to 43 from zero mentees to 40 plus, from no project contributors to over 300, from no contributions to over 30,000. And it's all thanks to the great work that these organizations you see on the screen have stewarded throughout time and the communities behind them that believe in this as well. And that's what makes this all possible. So if you're interested in participating in the Open Mainframe Project um, past today here, and I would really encourage you to learn about sort of the big initiatives that we're gonna be discussing here in today's uh, meetup. There's a number of different ways you can um, participate. One is obviously is just getting involved in the communities, just like any of the projects we host here at the Open Mainframe Project or any Open Mainframe Project. Um, and you know, through all of those means, we have a ton of projects that are here. I encourage you to check them out um, and also potentially bring your own project here. If you see an area and you see something interesting you're doing the mainframe, um, this is a place that would love to be a host of it. And if you're a organization that is seeing the stewardship and the future of the mainframe and open source as critical to your business and an important thing that you want to see moving forward, there's opportunities um, for stewardship in the community. So with that, if you want to learn more about the Open Mainframe Project after today, um, you can check out our website. We have a newsletter, which goes out about every once a month and is a great opportunity to see what's going on in the project. You can check out any of our projects and working groups. And obviously, there's opportunities to get involved um, as a member as well. So with that, I want to pause here a little bit um, and see if there's any questions that I can help field.
it's not uh so John, uh, uh can people uh, uh uh say something uh over the uh, microphone or uh you want the uh you want you want them to uh, type in the question in the q and a um i'm fine either way if people would want to talk um on the microphone that's um completely fine okay so anyone has any questions あの、もしあの、日本人の方で日本語で質問されたい方は、あの、言っていただければ、あの、私あの、翻訳いたしますんで。え、じゃあ I just said, you know, if anyone uh, from Japan would like to uh, ask question in Japanese language, I will uh, uh, more than happy to help translation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Anyone? Last call. Okay, uh, thank you so much, John. So uh, I guess now we have a, a, a five minutes uh, break. Uh, so uh, uh, the next speaker uh, can uh, prepare for the uh, uh, slides and everything. That sounds yeah. good. You'll take five minutes here and we'll be right back. Yeah, so uh, we, uh, uh, we we will take five minutes break and uh, uh, we will come back in uh, uh, around uh, 1030 in Japan time. So next session will be uh, Zoe by uh, Yakub uh, Borha. Um, we are going to be having um, a recording for this part of the session here. So I'm going to share um, that recording. Uh, actually, hold on. Let me make sure that the recording shared correctly here. Yep. All right. So we're going to go ahead and play it right now. Hi, everyone. My name is Joe Winchester. I work for IBM, and I'm going to chat to you today about Zoe. Our homepage is zoe.org, and three of the things that we try to do is make the mainframe open, make it simple, and make it familiar, both to the current generation of mainframers and to the next generation that's growing up and coming to the platform. So from our website, you can get all of our documentation online. You can have links to all of the repositories where our open source code is provided and maintained by the community, and you can download Zoe drivers. To four main components. The first two we're going to look at are the command line interface and the Zoe Explorer. And then we'll take a look at the others, uh, the Zoe Desktop and the API Mediation Lab. Okay, so the command line interface. So for folks who are used to working with tools like Docker or Git or things like that, they provide GUIs, graphical user interfaces, but they also provide CLIs. So I, I tend to do like git push, git clone, you know, docker start and docker run and so forth. The CLI really fills that space. So it runs on my laptop, here I'm running it on my Mac, and you, uh, it's a node package, you install it with a node package manager. And it's broken down into a number of groups. So let's take a look at some of the base groups. So when you first type Zoe, you'll see its capabilities. And one of the nice things is you can think, okay, Zoe files. So we now know Zoe is able to manipulate files. When I type the word Zoe files, what happens is it reveals more information to me. So it tells me what I can do. I can work with data sets and Unix system services. I can migrate and recall, mount and unmount file systems. Now I think, okay, so let, now I want to go and list some files, which is, is the Zoe files list. So you just type Zoe files list, and it will tell me, well, what do you want to list? You can list all members, data sets, file systems, Unix system files, and so forth. Now, if I say I want to do Zoe files list data sets, it gives me examples. This is nice. This is called progressive discovery. It's a bit like when you search on the internet, you know, it reveals information to you as you present yourself and what you're trying to find. So as you start typing in Zoe's command, if you don't know the full syntax and just leave a bit off, it will tell you what's coming up next. And Zoe files list data sets, I can just type in a, a high level qualifier with an asterisk wild carding and it will list them all back from me. I've just done that from my laptop. So a little quick scenario. So Zoe files list data set, winch.j.star will return the result. I can list all of my members. 
let's go and have a look at the one called copy job. I can see copy job uh, calls this program here, mainframe program IBG and ER, copying from and to. I'm just catting that because I've downloaded that. I'm going to submit that job and I can see down here that that worked. Uh, when I look at jobs, I can list jobs for a spool file um, ID. I can download the actual spool file itself and list it locally. I can create directories. I'm not creating that directory. That's not on Mukda on my laptop. I'm creating that directly on the USS path. I'm just going to create a little file on my laptop and upload it. And I can see it worked because I do Zoe files, list files. I can see it's uploaded. But my permission's not quite right. So I can issue a command chmod. Again, I'm manipulating mainframe data just directly from my Mac terminal. Now, one of the nice things about Zoe's command line interface is you can type Zoe HW and you'll see a little, it opens a little browser with all of the online help that you can search. So I can see my list jobs command just by typing it within there. Where the CLI is useful isn't just typing commands, but I can script it. So this is a shell scripting language starts off, uh, matches, it's using some uh, jQuery commands. And what's nice, if I have a look, Zoe ZOS files delete data set, Zoe ZOS files create, upload, Zoe ZOS. So for somebody who's familiar with scripting in Unix or Groovy or Perl, Python, Ruby R, a modern scripting language, they can manipulate the mainframe without having to uh, issue TSO commands or you know, do mainframe developing. And that's very, very useful when we start looking at scenarios like DevOps. So if I have a, a pipeline written in Jenkins or Bamboo or Team City or Travis or something like that running off from the mainframe, I can start to drive the mainframe, query logs, run commands, do logic, and that's very useful for CRTD pipeline, very useful for automation and many other orchestration scenarios. I see that's a very popular um, uh, scenario for Zoe. Now, for folks who are worried about security, this is all working across <coughs> secure encrypted communication Credentials are stored in my laptop's native credential store, so they can't be sort of fished or attacked by malware. And also, as we'll see later, Zoe supports multi-factor authentication, X509 client certificates, and um, you know certificates held in SAF key rings, and it's, it's enterprise resilient. Now, the CLI doesn't just have base capabilities for working with ZOS. It's extensible. Think of your mobile phone. You have base software on your phone, but you can go to an app store and get more. The CLI is no different. So a couple I'm just going to rattle through quickly, a Kix and DB2. So when I've installed an extension, what's nice is the extension to Zoe will still be appearing in all of the help. So I can see, I can just type Kix and I can see everything I can do with Kix. Uh, I can, a little quick example, if I look at defining a program, I can define my program in a, in a Kix CSD. Um, in a group and a region name. I can install, I can discard, and I can do new copies, and I can do a lot of manipulation. So when I'm doing that DevOps pipeline, and perhaps I've compiled the program, if I want to deploy it into a Kix region, I can do that all from the safety of the CLI. And for DB2, one of the nice things here, I've just got a little animated GIF, is I can just run queries. Zoe DB2 executes SQL query, and I just run a simple uh, count of uh, all of the tables that I've got available. And this is very nice, again, for folks who want to run DB2 queries, I can also execute store procedures and I can actually export tables directly down onto my laptop. So I've got the result coming back there. Now, Zoe provides extensions to the CLI. We can see some here with the Zoe logo. We provide extension for Kix, DB2, IMS, MQ, and FTP. But it's also a bit like your App Store when something is certified to be on your App Store. Zoe has what's called a conformance program for each of its extensible components. So when somebody gets a conformance badge, as a user, you know there's a consistent user experience uh, around things like single sign-on and around things like the, the ability to, to, to work within the, the, the CLI framework. And this is great. And we can see some, a lot of offerings, uh, a few from IBM, a lot from Broadcom, who are really the major contributor to CLI, Phoenix Software, and there's some more coming down the line. And what's nice about these is that these all remain working. So if you update your Zoe, uh, base underlying command line interface, these plugins remain functional. Okay, so after looking at the CLI, which I can install on my MacBook and use to manipulate mainframe data, let's look at the next component, an extension to the Visual Studio Code IDE. I 
marketplace plugin called the Zoe Explorer. So having obtained the Zoe Explorer and installed it, a little Zoe graphic will appear on the tile bar on the left. And three different views, data sets, Unix system services, and jobs. One of the things that's nice about the Zoe Explorer and the CLI is they share a lot of the same code and a lot of the same data. So the list of systems that I've got available here, and in fact the underlying logic uh, written using some shared node packages actually uh, comes from a software development kit that powers both the CLI and the Zoe Explorer. So let's have a look at what I can do. So with data sets, I can filter by a uh, high level qualifier, including wildcards. They'll show me a list of my PDSs. I can uh, select one, you know, create new members, um, you know, upload new members, which is very nice if I have something available on my laptop and I just want to transfer it into a PDS member. Um, for members themselves, I can edit them and I can submit a job if it's JCL. And when the job is submitted, you actually get a little hyperlink with the job ID that you can click. It'll take you straight to the spool for that. From the job suite itself, I can also filter for um, uh, prefix, a bit like SDSF pre, uh, pre star, and, and things like that. I can search for job by ID. Here I've got a prefix of ZWE, it looks like, and I've got my Zoe jobs. Menu actions, get JCL, it's like SJ, I can modify, stop, and purge. And what's very nice that I love, which is why uh, I use this day to day rather than SDSF, is if I'm looking at a spool, I have the whole spool file here. I don't have to open an SDSF and be, and be um, using a PF keys to go right and down and some of the sort of fine, fine commands. I can just use control plus and control, you know, control shift plus to select. I can use the find functionality. I, I see an overview here, so once I find it. So you're getting the, the, the marrying of the power of VS Code with mainframe data. Unix system services, uh, enter the high level directory, uh, you know, create directories, upload files, and so forth. Um, upload files is very nice. I just get a little Mac file chooser. Um, and what's nice as well is now the Zoe Explorer doesn't deliver any particular editor plugins. It lets you edit a file. It will actually do things like respect locks. It doesn't put NQs on PDS members, but if somebody modifies it from behind you, it uses optimistic locking. Um, it will tell you it's been modified and give you the chance to either overwrite it or open a diff browser and resolve that conflict. But if in VS Code from the marketplace you have extensions for working with shell script or mainframe languages like JCL or high-level assembler or Rex or um, you know COBOL, then you marry those two together and it gives you a very nice direct edit experience where you can mix and match plugins from the marketplace, just like you can mix and match plugins on your mobile phone together. It reminds me very much of Eclipse extensions for folks who are familiar with Eclipse, which is a very popular Java-based IDE. This is a Node IDE, but it's got the same extension uh, concept. So at the start of 2020, the Zoe Explorer had about 1,000 downloads, and it ended with 29,000. And there's a few key events as, um, that really propelled its adoption. So the Open Mainframe project themselves actually created, around last April, they, they uh, launched a COBOL programming course. This was in recognition of the need to have more skilled COBOL engineers to deal with the uh, importance of uh, transactional systems uh, running the sort of backbone of the economy and, and certainly a lot of government systems that have been under sort of duress during the pandemic as they've, as they've been helping, you know, companies and folks through. If we look at, uh, this is a screenshot of the course, this is VS Code and the Zoe Explorer. COBOL Fridays was created last year as a way for folks who are interested in COBOL to just get together, virtually chat, and they had a bunch of meetups, a lot of recordings if folks missed it and want to go back and see some of the education. But again, without any real push from the Zoe community, uh, we have a screenshot here where Get Hands On Run a COBOL program. They're not teaching COBOL with ISPF 3.4 edit. They're teaching COBOL with the Zoe Explorer in VS Code. And in September last year, the Master of the Mainframe Contest, which is a 16-year-old uh, academic initiative um, to uh, let students and anybody else learn mainframe skills, having previously been taught using 3270 interfaces, pivoted towards VS Code and the Zoe Explorer plugin. And we can see here Jeff Bisty, who was very much part of that with his big smiling, beautiful face, 
pointing at the Zoe Explorer, editing some JCL. Uh, Bill Pereira, part of the Zoe Onboarders squad, he's part of this initiative. He has his own YouTube channel, if folks don't know Bill, um, with a lot of playlists if anybody wants to see um, VS Code and plugins for Master the Mainframe. So what we're seeing is, without any real push from the Zoe community, folks out there wanting to teach and learn the mainframe are now rallying around this technology. And that's something that within Zoe we're very, very proud of. And thanks to everybody who's been part of that. So the two components we just looked at, the Zoe CLI and the VS Code extension, the Zoe desktop, are running on my laptop. There's no part of Zoe is installed on ZOS, which makes it quite a good first experience because as long as you have one of the endpoints, which could be ZOSMF, REST API configured, could be FTP, could be Kex, it could be DB2, IMS, or one of those vendor products we looked at, you can enjoy that Zoe modernization experience without mainframe software being installed. The next component we're going to look at is slightly different. You don't need to have anything installed on your PC to access the Zoe desktop. You do need to install a Zoe ZOS component that we deliver in both SMP format and we deliver it as a sort of uh, Unix convenience build. The advantage of this, perhaps over having a desktop install, is I know many customers, mainframe shops, where they actually struggle with updating um, desktop software on, on, on their end users' client machines. And just the same way if you or I do our banking or uh, shopping on the internet, something very nice about being able to go to a home page and always have the, the, the most current up-to-date experience. So the Zoe desktop is a zero client install. Here I'm running it through Google Chrome. I log on to my TSO user ID and password, and it's inspired a little bit like any other desktop, perhaps on my Mac OS or Windows or a Linux OS. Um, there's a list of applications or plugins in the bottom left-hand corner. I can search for them, and I'll go through a few of the very popular ones that the Zoe desktop comes provided with. The first is the file editor. Now. What we can see here is I'm looking at Unix system services, I'm looking at directories, I've got a nice tree structure I can filter, and I can actually direct edit files. Content type on the right, I'm looking at shell script. It comes with a number of content types that will auto detect, and it's a fairly rich set of languages it's based upon the Monaco editor. From a file, uh, you know, a directory or anything in the tree pop-up menu, it's fairly rich. I can cut and copy and paste. I can do in-place renames. I can uh, tag files if they've been tagged incorrectly. That's a, equivalent to a Unix to tag command. Um, and I can change the permissions, view the permissions, and I can do it recursively on a directory. That's the equivalent of a, of a Unix to mod minus R. It's not just Unix system services files. I can look at data sets, and again, I'm looking at some PDSs here, and we can see on the right, I've got some uh, JCL that's been rendered. As well as rich GUIs, the desktop comes with a 3270 emulator. And from there, I can just log on, with my, again, with my TSO credentials, and I can use all of my traditional mainframe commands, ISP, F, SDSF, CDO, CMT, Spoofy, and so forth. This is one of the nice things about the Zoe desktop, is, um, all of the old with all of the new. Whatever my experience, whatever my skill set, whatever task I want to perform, we're not prescriptive that you have to use a rich GUI, very comfortable with mainframers using what they're um, uh, grown up with and are most productive at. Now, the real power of the desktop comes when these applications are hosted side by side. They benefit from a single web address. They benefit from a single sign-on. I was only challenged once for my TSA user ID and password. Um, but they also can talk to each other. There's a very nice framework called app-to-app -app communication. And an example of this is the Zoe desktop, if we look at the bottom right, has something called the Jet Explorer. It's the functional equivalent of STSF. I can look for jobs, and here I'm looking at a DB2 master job. But Rather than me filtering and going in just from the top level and, 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 and typing in my job prefix, in the file editor on the left-hand side, when I uh, submit a job, 
it is able to navigate me to this to let me see the spool. That app-to-app -app communication and launch in context, and that's a pluggable, extensible API. And what that means is that these running in the desktop, the whole is greater than the sum of the individual parts. And switching and passing context back and forth makes this very powerful, very much like on any uh, windowing operating system we're used to. Perhaps we can open a file with a particular type and then open uh, you know, a reader or an editor that came from another vendor. Now the Zoe desktop itself has, it's multilingual, you can switch the language of the desktop, um, which uh, will be pervasive across all applications that support that language bundle. I can change my password, which is very nice if my password has expired or perhaps it was a, a one-time use password that I was given. And if I don't like the desktop it comes with, I can personalize it, I can theme it, customize it. Here I've got um, a lot of customers I talk to with their Zoe desktops, they customize it to somewhere they'd rather like to be. So perhaps a picture of them skiing or biking or in my case, a sort of beautiful woodland scene. And Zoe desktop applications don't have to run in the desktop as a sort of picture in picture and tile. They can be launched full screen. Here's an example of the 3270 emulator that's in its own browser. And again, this can be bookmarked and shared so you can just click it and launch it you know, directly from wherever you want to. And this is nice because I know customers who literally install Zoe just for this because it means that they don't have to have any host emulation software installed on their laptops. You basically have a mainframe experience with nothing more than a web browser. So one of the nice things about the Zoe desktop is it's extensible. So Thinking back to the mobile phone, when we have base core, uh, core apps and we can get extension apps, extensions are available, again, with a conformance badge that can be issued, programming to a public API that means that they interoperate well together and interoperate well within the desktop. A couple of samples, we see some nice ones. Uh, there's a few from IBM and Broadcom. Rocket have a very nice um, Blue Zone web product. And uh, Sega's Engineering got their first Zoe conformance badge last year, which we're very proud of. And their SQL workload expert for DB2 runs in the desktop and benefits from single sign-on and being able to work alongside those other apps to give a nice, rich, zero client install mainframe experience. So the last component I'd like to look at is the API mediation layer within Zoe. The API mediation layer can be thought of as the engine for Zoe, the workhorse that does the heavy lifting that gives Zoe all of these great features. So it's Netflix Zool running under ZOS, running under Unix system services. It provides services such as API routing. It's an API gateway for folks who are familiar with the reverse proxy um, pattern. It gives us single sign-on, which can be extended to multi-factor authentication products, that all of the heavy lifting for X509 client, client certificate authentication. It has an API catalog that can render APIs uh, that describe their um, interfaces, metadata, and other swagger or open API spec. It can do workload balancing. It gives a single certificate, so it's a very nice client server management product for ZOS services. And it gives uh, support for high availability and also off platform Docker. Let's have a quick look at how it does this. Sorry for this busy chart. This is from the Zoe architecture diagram in docs.zoe.org. And what you'll see is Zoe desktop applications, CLI and the VS Code extension Zoe Explorer all running on laptops, on PCs, talking to ZOS. Now it's busy down here, but this is the API get gateway edge server that sits in between the client traffic and the server traffic. So for example, when a request comes in, a REST request comes in that says, I need a particular piece of data, I want some UI from a service, it is responsible for finding that service, which could be running under different ports, perhaps with different certificates. So we have that single point of access. That's a reverse proxy pattern. The mediation layer itself has a catalog we talked about. There are some base services that are provided. And from the catalog, for folks who are familiar with Swagger, you can see the APIs, you can try them out. It's very extensible. There's a nice set of products. Again, huge number from Broadcom here, Phoenix and IBM, and there's others coming along soon that can benefit from this. So single sign-on occurs because when the client talks to the API gateway and says, here I am, it generates a token that the client stores in either a browser cookie or perhaps in a credential store. And that's used on subsequent requests. And 
on ZOS, that token can be used to generate a pass ticket. So you don't need a persistent password, and that's how multi-factor authentication products can work. It also provides load balancing because when the client talks to not directly to its endpoint, which is a very brittle sort of one-on-one -on -one conversation, but through the gateway, it can find the most available service to route that to. All of this runs on the Unix system services by default, but one of the very nice things that's going on at the moment is that's also available to run in Docker containers, either on Linux or um, ZTX uh, running inside MBS, or also running off-platform in the Intel AMD container, which is very nice in a hybrid cloud story. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, we've looked at all of the four main Zoe components. Um, how to stay in touch, how to stay involved. So we have a very healthy community on Slack, uh, channels where you can reach out and work with the developers, the documentation, ID, ask questions, very friendly, welcoming community. Um, Medium.com, we have a blog site where a lot of committers and customers are writing some phenomenal content that you can uh, and you can post if you'd like to become an author, please do. On social media, uh, there's a lot going on on social media. A couple of folks there have called out Jessalyn Poonongbang, aka Jelly, who's actually now the leader to Zoe Explorer Squad, Bill Pereira there. Uh, Jelly has her own Mainframe Bytes YouTube channel. Bill Pereira has lots of great um, Zoe videos. LinkedIn, uh, please follow the Open Mainframe Project uh, if you're not already. Um, and just to summarize, Zoe, we're building more than technology, we're building a community, and if you'd like to be part of that community, uh, please reach out, and uh, thanks very much, enjoy the rest of your day. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, uh, anyone, uh, we, have, uh, we have a few minutes to uh, take questions. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, speak up, either speak up or uh, uh, type in, in the uh, chat or Q&A window. So we have, we, uh, because of the time difference, uh, uh, Yakub is not uh, uh, able to answer questions, but uh, instead, uh, Joe Winchester uh, is here uh, to stand by to uh, answer any questions, if, you, if anyone has any questions. Okay, uh, last call. All right, uh, let's take a few minutes break, uh, uh, three minutes break, uh, and we are going to start uh, uh, from uh, 11 a.m. Uh, the next session is going to be Linux and open source on uh, IBM Z and uh, Linux One. Uh, so uh, uh, please come back in three minutes or so. We start a session in less than one minute. Uh, we are going to restart it uh, from 11 a.m. Japan time. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's get uh, let's get restarted. Uh, so uh, the next session, uh, Mike uh, Freesinger from uh, Freesinger from uh, Suze will discuss about Linux and open source on IBM Z and Linux One. So, Mike, uh, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Nori. I'm gonna take just a moment to get my screen share going. Okay, I hope that everybody can see my uh, screen. And, uh, and so I'd, uh, I'd like to say thank you. Um, and, and like Nori said, I'd like to take um, the next uh, 20, 25 minutes to talk about Linux and open source and IBM Z and Linux One. But before I get to talking about the topic, I'd like to take just a few moments to tell you about myself. Now, 
Um, you probably saw that I work for SUSE. So you're thinking this presentation is gonna be about SUSE. That is absolutely not the truth. Um, yes, I will talk a little bit about SUSE in, in some of the slides, but the majority of this presentation is talking about Linux and open source, looking at it from a community perspective. Yes, I always wear my SUSE hat, but today I take my SUSE hat off and I will put on my community hat, my, my open mainframe project community hat. And the work that I'm doing in promoting the open mainframe project as a SUSE employee, but also as somebody very interested in the mainframe. Now, my day-to-day -day job is working with IBM. So I think of IBM as like my customer. My role is global. I work with many groups in IBM. Um, my job as a solution architect is to look at the technical things that our two companies can do together and come up ways to help our customers take advantage of that um, technology through documentation, through trainings and things like that. So I provided both my corporate email address as well as my personal email address um, and my telephone number. So if you ever wanted to reach out to me and talk to me about the Open Mainframe Project, what I'm doing and how I'm contributing as a community member, I'd love to hear from you. So let's go ahead and start uh, um, with the Linux distributions that are available for the mainframe for IBM Z and Linux One. Um, I've tried to keep these slides pretty, uh, pretty simple, but I wanted to be able to provide you links to the information uh, where you could find this yourself. <clears throat> so for Linux distributions that are supported by IBM, there are three of them, Canonical, Red Hat, and SUSE. I've tried to um, be in alphabetical order. They all are, are very good distributions. They all do a lot of great things on the platform. I am personally prefer the, the, the SUSE distribution, but I've had the opportunity to work and, to, and do things with Canonical and with Red Hat on IBM Z and Linux One. So if you're running in a corporate environment and you're utilizing Linux on your Z and Linux One system, you're probably gonna be using one of these three distributions, but, but you don't have to all the time. Um, there are community supported distributions that are available. And you saw John um, mention uh, some of those um, in his presentation. Um, I went to DistroWatch as one place DistroWatch gave me a list of them. It missed one of them that I want to go ahead and call out, Clef OS. Um, I didn't get that added uh, when I created these slides, but it dawned on me that Clef OS is also a, a community-supported Linux distribution that is available for IBM Z and Linux One. So whether you want to try Alpine Linux, which is was which was um, one of those mentorship projects that John spoke about and, and the uh, mentor and mentee actually uh, took Alpine Linux and built it for S390X and made it a, made it a community supported distribution or whether you want to try any one of the other open source community supported Linux distributions out there, go for it. Um, they work all very well. I've had the opportunity to try a number of those as well in, in uh, working on uh, in, in my role as the as a solution architect. So diving a little bit deeper into the, the, the virtualization capabilities on IBM Z and Linux One. Um, we'll, I'll spend a minute talking about ZVM and then I also wanna uh, talk about KVM, but, but for those that have been around the mainframe for a long time, um, ZVM has been a stalwart when it comes to virtualization. It is, uh, it is, it is the, 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 the virtualization technology that has been used for many years by mainframe customers. When I started my career 20 years ago, I started my career as a mainframe operator. And I didn't know a lot about the mainframe. I worked in the evening. My job was to submit uh, a JCL and run 
batch programs and then print out the reports. And I remember even back then, our developers and our systems programmers talking about virtualization on the mainframe. At the time, I didn't understand what that meant. But as I uh, have progressed in my career, and as I came to SUSE and learned that Linux could run on the mainframe, I learned very quickly that ZVM, the ZVM hypervisor, is one of the key technologies to allow Linux and open source technologies to run on the mainframe. Now, utilizing ZVM, it takes a little bit of learning, not a little bit, a lot of learning. And, and, and it may not always be the easiest to get up and running at first, but I can raise my hand and say that, yes, I have, I've, I've taken the time and I've, I've been able to learn ZVM. And so if your organization is utilizing ZVM and you have the ability to learn about it, absolutely take that opportunity. There's a lot of great things you can do with ZVM. If you can't get access to a ZVM environment and you want to, I'll talk about ways that you can do that here in just a moment. If you're more from the uh, Linux side of the house and used to Linux virtualization, then you can actually um, run KVM on, uh, on your favorite supported Linux distribution on Z and Linux One. And you can run KVM and then you can spin up virtual machines. The nice thing about this is you use the knowledge that you've gained about utilizing and running and working with KVM on your laptop or on other systems and other architectures. It works the same way. It does the same things. Yes, there are some differences. There are architectural differences and things like that, but those architectural differences are easy um, once you understand the power and you're familiar with KVM, it's pretty easy to pick up and run with those architectural differences. So going a, a layer deeper. So now you've got your operating systems that you can run on, on IBM Z and Linux One. You can run it in uh, uh, multiple hypervisors, ZVM or KVM. You can also run it on bare metal. I didn't really talk about that, but you can run Linux natively on an LPAR, a logical partition on the Z system. Once you get Linux up and running, then what can you do with it? Well, you can do just about anything with it. Um, um, the IBM community um, does a really good job of looking at all of the most popular open source software that's out there in the world today, whether it be databases, whether it be languages, whether it be cloud-like technologies, and they do a very good job to make sure that those projects are, um, are represented on the S390X architecture. So whether it be databases like Apache Spark or ElasticStack or MariaDB or MongoDB or Postgres, or it be, um, um, those are all open source databases or whether it be um, databases from vendors that you wanna run on the platform and run on top of Linux on the platform. Absolutely, you can do those kind of things. And there's a lot of great use cases on customers taking advantage of both, of both proprietary um, 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 organization supported databases as well as open source databases. If development is your thing, there's lots of languages to go. And this is just a, a, a short list of languages. Some of the most popular languages like Go that uh, Kubernetes and containers are, are built on top of, or Java or Node.js, just to name a few, are some of the languages that you can use on the platform. When it comes to cloud and cloud-like services, the Z, the mainframe, the Z system, the Linux One system is, is, is an amazing platform because it is a cloud in a box that can be in your own data center and can be used to run a myriad of, of workloads, whether that be virtual machines that are managed by technologies like OpenStack or container-based technologies 
that you know, container technology tools like Cryo or Docker or Podman mm -hmm. allow you to build the containers, run the containers, test the containers. But then what you really need to do is be able to orchestrate those containers. And that's where it's become really hot on um, Z. Um, you heard uh, Joe, uh, um, uh, well, you heard Jacob actually talk about, about containers running on ZOS. And absolutely, so you can take a container that you've built on Linux on Z and run it in a ZOS name uh, address space. Um, um, going one step further, now you can take those containers that are running on top of Linux and you can orchestrate those with Kubernetes. You can do amazing things. You can tie Kubernetes containers to your mainframe data that's sitting on your traditional mainframe operating systems like ZOS and, and TPT, uh, 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 T, uh, well, I'm getting myself mixed up there, but ZOS. So um, I, I encourage you to go to uh, the link above to look at the open source software. And if you see something that is not available, the community is very open to hearing what you want to do and how you want to do it. And, 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 and the IBM team um, that works behind this community are very knowledgeable. I've had the opportunity to work with many of them uh, regarding uh, bringing other open source, uh, open source software packages to Linux on Z. So now you saw a slide uh, similar to this that uh, John showed as he talked about some of the some of the projects that are going on within the Open Mainframe project that are that are more Linux focused. And so I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about each of these um, Open Mainframe projects, tell you a little bit more of what they do and how they work. Um, let me start on the left hand side and talk about Console Z. It is the, the newest of the projects to the Open Mainframe project family, I believe. Um, it uh, uh, um, actually was created um, uh, by, a, uh, by an organization, a partner organization of the Open Mainframe project. And within their company, they saw a particular need to be able to give team members a web UI access to ZVM consoles. Not just be able to give them access to the ZVM consoles, but also for certain people and certain team members, give them access to commands that they need. So no longer do you need to fire up a 3270 console, which I still do all the time, but um, for those users in an organization that mostly need read access to the consoles, or maybe need just a few commands, not a, not a, not a lot of commands, but a few commands, maybe they're network administrators and they need to be able to administer vSwitches, or maybe they need to look at storage or, or, or other things within the system, then console Z not only gives those folks the ability to look at the ZVM consoles, but they also, through a web-based interface, can issue commands that they need to run uh, that are specific to their job within an organization. Now moving to the next project to the right, which is Phalong. This is the project that I've been most involved with um, since, uh, since starting with the Open Mainframe project. Since SUSE became, well, since SUSE was one of the founding members of the Open Mainframe project. Shortly, uh, shortly after that, um, discussions started and the Phalong project was born. For those that don't know ZVM and that don't want to take the time to learn all of the, 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 the commands and all of the things that you need to do inside a ZVM, um, which, are, which are developers, you know, uh, many developers don't want to take the time to learn how to work with the 3270 console, how to interact with this, this hypervisor called ZVM. They would rather develop and use RESTful APIs to operate ZVM. And that includes both Linux guests, um, um, images, networking, disks, um, whether that be DASDY disks, um, SCSI LUNs, and things like that. Phalong presents a RESTful API and a development SDK for managing ZVM. 
Now this project has been around for a while and, and um, actually it was contributed to the Open Mainframe project by our friends at IBM. Um, but this project has a, a very strong following of people globally that are working to make the code base stronger, to, 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 to give people the ability to develop their own interfaces uh, to manage ZVM, or if you want, you can use OpenStack, or if you prefer, and you'd like to get a, 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 a product from a company, there are companies out there that actually sell products that embed Phalong inside the product that helps in managing ZVM. And the last project that I'd like to take a moment and talk about is Tessia. Now, I have not had a lot of opportunity to interact with the Tessia uh, group at, at this point and the Tessia project, but um, it is a tool that helps in automation in simplifying the installation, configuration, and testing of Linux systems. And it does that for multiple Linux distributions. So let's just use SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, for example. We have a tool in SUSE Linux Enterprise Server called AutoYast, um, and AutoYast uh, is a way to define and automate the installation of SUSE Linux Enterprise Server. Tessia can actually call AutoYast and help deploy um, SUSE Linux Enterprise Server in a Linux system, whether that be on a LPAR, whether that be in ZVM, or whether that be in KVM. Um, Tessia works with the other Linux distros. So if you're familiar with Kickstart from Red Hat, there's another example, Tessio will call Kickstart and start the installation of Red Hat based systems. So now getting access to um, IBM Z and Linux One, getting access to the mainframe, getting access to uh, ZVM, not always easy. As you can see here in my office, I don't have a Z system sitting here. Luckily, I, uh, our company does have uh, several Z systems uh, within our corporate headquarters, but IBM has done a great service of being able uh, to allow uh, anyone um, all over the world to be able to get access to an IBM Z instance. Now, this IBM Z instance is running Linux and it's called um, the, the Linux One Community Cloud. Um, you can go ahead and, and go to the link that I have listed up at the top of the page. It's running on IBM Linux One platform. There's no charge. It's enterprise grade. It's really easy to use because it's a web-based interface that you use. So if you're familiar with provisioning cloud-like Linux instances in other cloud providers, you'll find this to be very easy to do as well because it's a web-based interface. The great thing is you don't have to pay for it. It's, it's almost always up. There are a few times when they have to take it down and do some work. And I know the, the person at Marist uh, College that does the work on this and, and she's great, but she's also very good about letting you know. It's up and available 24 by seven and you have access to that Linux instance for 120 days at no cost. Now it is a shared public cloud environment. So there are, there are things in place to protect users from breaking the system, from doing things that are bad to the system. But, but if you are looking at doing any development work or you just wanna try out um, Linux on Z or you're a professor or an entrepreneur, you're, you're thinking about you know, what could you use this platform for? Here's a great way to see Linux running on the platform. Now, this is Linux on the platform. If you want to learn more about ZVM on the platform and your company doesn't allow you to access ZVM, then get involved with the projects that I just spoke about, especially the Phalong project and the Console Z project because um, member companies have, have contributed parts of their mainframe to our projects 
and we have ZVM environments. So if you want to learn how to use ZVM and you want to do it in, and you want to contribute to Feilong, come to the Feilong project, learn more about what we do there. Um, and, and then you can request access to a ZVM environment so you can actually develop, um, document, try, uh, anything you need to do in support of the Feilong project. And uh, I'd like to wrap it up um, with this slide. And just, you've already heard um, everybody talk about how you can get involved. Um, I definitely recommend going and looking at the GitHub projects. Just go to github.com, open mainframe project, and all of the projects, the community projects are available. There's a lot more information that's available um, as well. Um, you can find uh, um, um, uh, information about our meeting minutes, about the different uh, communities, when they've met, and, and, and all of those great things. Um, in addition to going to GitHub, you can go to mainframeproject.org forward slash projects. You can see the projects that are out there. Zoe's out there. Um, um, by the way, I got to give a shout out to Zoe. So for the Phelan project, we're actually using the Zoe um, desktop for remote access uh, to that ZVM environment. And through the 3270 console, that's in the Zoe desktop, as well as the SSH client in the Zoe desktop, you're able to at least one, that's one way of being able to access ZVM and be able to work on the Phelong project. Zoe's, uh, so Zoe is part of the projects that's listed there. Phelong is there, Console Z. Um, there's a large list of projects. I, th I think there's like 16, 17 projects that are out there today. And then you've already heard how to interact with the OMP community. Um, you can do that through a number of, of ways, the forums, through mailing lists, through Slack channels. It's a great way to be able to communicate with us directly uh, via the Slack channel. Sign up, you know, I'll just give you an example for Feilong Slack channel, and you can chat with me. I try and be pretty responsive on that. And then absolutely take a look at the calendars uh, and you can see when the next meetings are for any of the projects you might be interested in. And so with that, hopefully you've learned a little bit more about Linux and open source and how it applies to the Open Mainframe Project. Hopefully you've been given some ideas on how you can get engaged with the Open Mainframe Project. And with that, I'd like to thank you and open it up for any questions. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, anyone has any questions to uh, Mike? And uh, so we have a few minutes to uh, uh, answer any questions. So uh, please, uh, if you have any questions, please either speak up or uh, uh, type in, in the chat window or Q&A window. Uh, there's a question. Uh, is there a, a platform difference using KVM instance of uh, uh, ZVM? Um, no. So, um, the, 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 well, I shouldn't say no. There are some slight differences at the hardware layer because KVM on Z um, can emulate DASD devices, or you can work with devices that look like DASDs and, and things like that. It can connect to DASDs um, as well as as well as SCSI LUNs. Um, so you can't do that on KVM um, on other architectures. But if you're used to using tools like Versh or Vert Manager or uh, Q QEMU IMG to create QCOW uh, disk images, or um, uh, you'll, you'll see that it works exactly the same. Thank you. Uh, so uh, th did that answer, question, uh, answer the uh, question? I, I think so. The question, yes, the, the, I, the question was, is, 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 is uh, 
Is oh, KVM on Z some uh, like KVM on other architectures? Is that what the question was? Yeah, question was, uh, there, uh, is there a performance difference between KVM? Uh, performance difference. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Um, so no, I um, uh, the when KVM first became available on the Z platform, I believe that there was some performance um, um, things that needed to be worked out. But the great team at IBM in Bubligen, Germany um, have worked very hard. And, and, and today I run KVM virtual machines all the time and they perform very well um, um, compared to the Linux running in ZVM or even Linux running on an LPAR. Now I've answered the question. Uh, Nori, yeah. sorry, I, I didn't hear that performance question. Uh, sorry, uh, I, I was not clear enough. Okay, uh, anyone has any, any more questions? I think we have a few minutes to answer questions. And um, I'll, I'll jump in. So I, uh, um, there's, a, um, there's a person that is totally new within the SUSE organization. And today um, I told him about our self-service access to Z. So within SUSE, any SUSE employee can use a web-based interface to get to our Z system and they can get their own virtual machine. And, and it's running on ZVM. And uh, um, he had never touched uh, a Z system ever. And within 30 minutes, he had his first Linux instance up and running. It was less than that. Um, and then he was even trying to go off and install his own Linux. We give uh, our employees the ability to install their own Linux. We, we provision, uh, automatically provision a Linux. Um, but then if they want to get to the 3270 console and they want to try and run uh, their own installation, they can go and do that. So, it, um, you know, don't be scared of, of working with uh, Z and, and the mainframe. Uh, people pick it up and, and it, it's, especially Linux makes it very easy to start learning it. And Linux hides much of the differences that are at the hardware layer, you know, the DASD devices or the, or the networking cards and all of that. Linux hides all of that and makes it very easy. So anybody with Linux skills can pick up and, and get started with Linux on the mainframe very quickly. Got it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, so let's take a few minutes break and uh, uh, let's uh, get back to the uh, uh, session uh, 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 starting from 11.30 in Japan time. Thank you. We're just taking one minute break, one minute break and we get we will get started Okay, uh, let's let's get restarted. So uh, the final session of today's uh, meetup is uh, talking about the future of COBOL. So this session uh, will be provided by uh, uh, Suharasana Sridvansan and David Nicolette and Cameron CA. So uh, uh, Suharasana, uh, I guess the floor is yours now. Thank you so much. 
um, Noriaki-san, I'm going to share my screen here real quick. Yes, please. All right, I hope everyone can see my screen. Let me put this in slideshow mode. One quick second. All right. Good morning, everybody, and good evening to everyone else from the rest of the world. Good morning, Japan. My name is Sudarshana Srinivasan. I am an IBM Z Influencer Program Manager and also the co-lead of the OMP programming, a COBOL programming course, along with Paul Newton and uh, Mike Bauer of um, Broadcom. So um, you heard both John and also Joe talk about COBOL, and COBOL made big news in the year 2020. It is the language of the global economy, but that said, it made big news in 2020. So the thing that a lot of people were talking about was around skills, the, the shortage of skills and, um, and such. So just putting things in context, what I'd like to bring here, oh, okay. What I'd like to share is just in context, keep in mind that skill shortage is not unique to the mainframe skills or enterprise computing skills. <clears throat> Here we are in 2021, still talking about manufacturing sk skills gap and even more so cybersecurity skills having, you know, there being a shortage in skills and finding the right talent for the job description, right? So while all of this was happening and COBOL was sort of front and center and folks talking about it, what we were already busy doing, and by we, I mean, um, a lot of our clients, American River College, IBM, a lot of us, uh, a lot of our SMEs came together, put our heads together, and we were busy at work. We were busy at work putting together the COBOL programming course, which with a lot of help from John Murtick and the op Open Mainframe Project, we launched on the Open, main open Mainframe Project back in April 2020. So what is our mission here with this COBOL programming course? Our goal really in putting this content together was to attract that next generation of learners and let them add COBOL to their tech toolkit. It is a skill that will be noticed. So the point is, how can we then improve that learning experience for that next generation of learners, right? So we've uh, woven in some modern tooling. We saw Zoe presentation that uh, Joe Winchester put together where it talks, talked about the Zoe uh, extension for VS Code. And that is exactly what the COBOL course also leverages as you'll see in a couple of slides from now. And also to create an, an engaging and enthusiastic community of learners. That was our mission. And that has definitely been something we've been successful. We've had, we have over 2000 learners on the Slack channel for COBOL. It is the most starred uh, pro project on open mainframe projects. So um, that said, I think it is one of the most popular open mainframe projects on um, OMP. So, so what are the benefits? I talked about it being the language of the global economy. And with over 2 billion lines of code in execution today, there is certainly opportunity here, right? So we need to keep that in mind and keep that in perspective. So the modern tooling I talked about is VS Code, Zoe, Code for Z, the Z Open Editor and more that we've put in, to put in place to enhance the learning experience. And um, the benefit of being part of this community, the COBOL programming course community, is it works with sister organizations, sister projects like Zoe and the COBOL working group. You'll hear from uh, Dr. Cameron Say here um, and the COBOL check, which Dave will be talking about as well. So it is a really highly visible project and a key differentiator to your professional profile, right? I mentioned it is an in-demand skill. It would be very valuable to add to your tech toolkit. Another really exciting uh, opportunity we're um, you know, able to offer this summer is the OMP Summer Mentorship Project. And here are some ideas that we've put in place for students who are interested and would like to be part of the COBOL Programming Course Mentorship Opportunity. We're really eager to see the applications that come through and uh, working with these students. 
right, through the summer, letting them have a taste of COBOL and also seeing what the student community has to offer and how we can further grow and nurture this uh, large engaging community of COBOL learners that we have created. So that said, the course itself, um, the very first basic co content that we've put out is in two parts. The first part really talks about the tooling. Again, um, to a traditional mainframer, uh, the, the ISPF and you know, the 30, TN 3270 screens are very familiar, but the modern tooling was something we wanted to take the time, explain and walk, through the, walk the learner through that step-by-step -step process of how you would get installed and get ready to get on your journey with COBOL. And then comes in the actual content around COBOL itself, right? So where we cover some of the basics of COBOL, what are the key divisions that we need to know and understand um, arithmetic, which is very important. COBOL was designed for business logic and that's what it does really well. So we do definitely dive into that and the data types and intrinsic functions um, are a few of those topics, right? Um, and as downstream projects, a couple of other projects that we worked on, and again, Joe touched upon these, which is the COBOL Fridays webinar series and a COBOL resource hub page. The, the COBOL Fridays webinar series is a huge learning resource. We've, we've, we were able to curate that series with inputs from industry experts, from academic uh, you know, folks who have done um, COBOL for many, many years in, in mainframe curriculum. And the resource hub is on IBM Developer, which is again, a wealth of information out there for anyone who is interested. Um, I think these decks will be uh, shared with our audience later. So you, will be, you should be able to get access to the link uh, to the deck and have access to these links. So who is our team that you know, has been driving this and really bringing this uh, out to our community and keeping it engaging? We have a few IBMers, Paul, Martin and myself, and uh, Jelly, Zabura, and Mike from the Broadcom team, and our very own, very famous John Mertik from um, or Linux Foundation as well. So that is our core member team that has been driving this project to where we are today. Um, so please join us, um, come here to learn, come here to contribute, come here to share. That is really what we're looking for is just, you know, sharing the passion um, for COBOL and all that it has to offer for our global economy. So with that, I will open it up to questions or, you know, while we're um, waiting for questions, turn it over to Dave perhaps. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, John, and um, everybody here for the opportunity to bring COBOL to the team here and share. So are we taking questions or do you want me to start talking? Uh, we'll keep an ID eye for questions in the background. Maybe if you want to start getting your stuff queued up and if we see any questions, I don't see any at the moment coming through. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dave. So, let me see. Because of my laptop setup, I can't tell if you can see the correct screen. So does it look screen. like a blue triangle? Yep, you look good. Yep. Okay. All right. So COBOL check. It's a relatively new project. Uh, the purpose of it is to fill a gap in the tooling that's available for testing COBOL. And that gap is shown in this diagram, which you may be familiar with this idea of the test automation pyramid or triangle. The idea is that we want to have a lot of automated tests at different levels. We want the largest number of tests to be very small so that they're cheap to run, they're fast, and they pinpoint errors directly so we don't spend a lot of time in analysis. This level that's labeled unit is really not covered by existing tools for mainframe COBOL. The rest of this is covered pretty well by a lot of tools. But what is different between COBOL and the mainframe and all the other languages out in the world is this concept of how small a unit can be. 
if you uh, have worked with, say, Java or C Sharp, when people talk about unit tests, they're talking about exercising one logical path through one method, and that's all. But the smallest unit of code that you can test with something like Z unit, for example, or Topaz, is a, a complete executable. So testing all the little variations at a low level can be pretty expensive and time consuming because you have to set up a lot of code and possibly test data for every scenario. So it can take a lot of time and you can miss things. So we wanted to provide as part of the philosophy of providing the new generation of mainframe developers with the kinds of tools that they're accustomed to. And they are accustomed to using tools that give them this very fine grained testing capability. And they're accustomed to using methods like incremental refactoring and test driven development. So we want to be able to give them that ability. Now I'm gonna to have to stop sharing in order to change screens. So give me a second and I will share again. Okay, I think this is correct. You see a kind of a flow chart that says COBOL check. Yep. Okay, good. So basically this is how the tool works. It runs as a standalone batch program. It's written in Java. So it's not, it's not integrated directly with other OMP projects, but it doesn't conflict with them either. The way it works is as a pre-compiler, it merges the developer's test cases with the program under test to produce a copy of that program. And that way, the copy of the program only executes the paragraphs that are mentioned in the test cases. It does not try to execute the entire program. And COBOL check also comments out all of the IO statements. Because uh, another aspect of unit testing out in the world outside of the IBM computer room <laughs> is that a unit test does not touch any external resources. It, its purpose of it is to exercise only the logic in the program under test and at a fine grained level. So hopefully that makes sense and I'll show you how it works right now or within a few seconds, hopefully. Okay, let me just double check. Are you now seeing a VS code screen with some COBOL? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so here's a program that copies one sequential file to another pretty basic kind of a COBOL program. And it has one input file, one output file, has some data elements defined. And it, all it really does is opens the files, um, moves the fields around to a different layout, and then writes the output file and counts the number of records. So it's pretty basic stuff. So if we wanted to exercise the individual paragraphs in this, we could write test cases that look like this. This is the new part. So you can define a test case, for example, like this one. And the uh, domain specific language or DSL for COBOL check has a few special keywords to make it easier to write test cases. One of them is this one test case. And it it's followed by a description of the test case. And then the, the typical arrange, act, assert sequence that you use for example-based testing, you can then set the preconditions for the test in the arrange step. And you just use standard COBOL for that. All you're doing is setting values in the data division. So this is setting up the data division to look the way it would look at the, at the time when you normally would perform this paragraph. So then you perform just that paragraph without the rest of the program. And then you can make assertions about the results, such as this. We expect in field one of input record to equal out field one. And it's just that simple. And I found that uh, COBOL programmers relate to this pretty easily and, and they pick it up immediately. They usually don't even need to read documentation. They just see a couple of examples and they can go from there. So let's see what happens when you run this.
This is the kind of output it generates. So it, it echoes the name of the test suite and it runs each test case, tells you if it passed or failed, it gives them a number. If the test case failed, it tries to highlight it a little bit and tells you what you expected, but what you actually got. So it was different. And this is very similar to other unit testing tools in other languages, if, you, if you're familiar with that, well, except they may show up in red and green. And because it's a command line program, you can integrate it with any kind of script or any CI, CD pipeline. So the idea, part of the idea here is that programmers can work without being connected to the, to the Z system. They can do a lot of this low level tough uh, kind of work uh, off platform where they can get very, very fast turnaround on their tests because they don't, they don't really need to set up data sets and databases at this level. You get higher on that pyramid, you do, but at the bottom level, you really don't need that. You, what you need is fast turnaround. So if you'd like to see what the tool does to the program when it's, when it's merging the test cases, the copy of the program for testing looks like this. And notice that it took out the IO statements from the input output section and moved them to working storage. Now, the reason for that is if you were to run this on the Z system, no storage would be allocated for these areas in the environment division unless you open the file, but we're not going to open the file. We're skipping that. So we have to have these areas available for the test cases to refer to. So it does that. It comments out the statements like open and close and read, and it just lets you uh, run the individual paragraphs. So it inserts some boilerplate test code. It's very verbose, but uh, the developer doesn't really need to worry about that because all they have to worry about is that uh, testing DSL, which was pretty concise, if you remember that. Well, you don't have to remember it, I can remind you. So it generates quite a few lines of COBOL for this, uh, but you don't need to maintain that. It's automatic. And there's, it sticks some more code in the top of the procedure division so that it avoids running the entire procedure division. And that's really all there is to this. So I don't have a long presentation to give you. Just wanted to show you the tool and how it works and uh, give you a sense of how it fits in with a developer's workflow. So that's all I've got, unless you've got some questions or comments. We'll keep an eye out in the chat for some of those. I know um, Sadoshna answered one in the, the chat around um, COBOL learning of which region or country has more interested people. Um, and if you look in the Q&A, um, she answered it's um, generally a pretty global interest. Um, and uh, for, I think, the Japan market, um, there is definitely a strong, um, a lot of opportunities around COBOL um, and COBOL skills. So um, hopefully that leads to some interesting opportunities and um, additional context um, for you all in that space. Um, I just saw one come question just come in here. Um, do you think the 2020 situations led to for non-framers more COBOL is important thoughts or COBOL is the problem? Um, he understands that COBOL is important in demand now, but the trend is also important for the future and learners. So, um, you know, for those COBOL, folks here uh, leading these talks. I don't know if you have any context or thoughts on that. Well, I don't think that uh, the situation in 2020 caused people to become interested in COBOL. I think that was a trend that was already happening and was, was gonna happen anyway. And as far as COBOL was the problem, I know there were some news items uh, in the United States and New Jersey in particular, where they were saying, oh no, the COBOL system is not able to keep up. But that wasn't really the problem. So I don't, I don't think that the 2020 situation caused either positive or negative press for COBOL. That's my take anyway. I, I think I resonate with what you say, Dave. Um, and, and the fact for, you know, the the question around the future uh, and what would it look like 
the truth is there will always be that requirement for COBOL skill. And as I said in my presentation, right, add COBOL to your tech toolkit. It is not to say you don't need to learn Java or Python or anything like that. Um, along with those uh, programming languages, add COBOL to your tech toolkit. It will get noticed. There are those big banks, there is insurance companies, there are healthcare providers who need this skill. And to have someone who understands it and can bring that diversity in all through all of those languages that they've learned would definitely set you apart. So that is my two cents in terms of looking ahead in future um, and what the skill set can do for you. Yes, absolutely. And it's not only those industries, but I know that in energy and transportation, mm -hmm. that uh, Z systems are still playing a big role. And there's and a lot of existing COBOL applications. If you look at IBM's mainframe modernization program, a big part of it is exposing these assets through APIs. Yes. That will mean changing existing COBOL applications, refactoring them. And in the rest of the world, we, we are we worry about refactoring when we don't have fine-grained <laughs> unit tests to protect us from making mistakes. So uh, a tool like COBOL Check could be useful when we are looking at this very old code, very large monolithic programs. If we need to start pulling those apart so that the appropriate parts can be exposed through APIs, it would be helpful to have these small unit tests to protect us from introducing regressions. Yeah, and I mentioned the COBOL Fridays webinar series. We actually have one episode that talks about APIs and how do you leverage APIs through COBOL programs and work with APIs to modernize uh, and bringing in Java into it. So do definitely check out the COBOL Fridays series. It is, uh, it is a wealth of information, like I said. Awesome. 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 Thank you for thank you for the question there. Um, so Cam, uh, we have the last part of the COBOL uh, presentation is um, from Cam C. Cam, do you want to um, speak? Yeah, you know it's it's not pleasant to be between um, the audience and adjournment, but I I, I saw this coming, so um, I knew that I was going to have like less than five minutes, so that's no problem. Um, I put together, uh, you know, just a couple of slides. Um, I wanted to give the audience kind of a snapshot of what we learned from the COBOL survey. So I represent the COBOL working group, a part of the Open Mainframe Project. We've been in existence since June of, of 2020, or 2019, right? No, 2020. Uh, we're very new. And uh, we were created to shine a light on COBOL, you know, um, kind of with more informational, it's kind of in parallel with Su what Suharshner's group is doing, but because um, they're doing an excellent job. And I must say, this has been an extraordinary group of presentations. But um, um, so we're basically informational. My, we have a couple of, of, a, a couple of major objectives that we want. We want to gather data about the use of COBOL. And we also want to develop a COBOL curriculum in the, in the classroom, uh, an academic uh, curriculum. Um, the class that, that Jeff Bisty and Sudharshna put together is excellent, but it's not for course credit. We want, we want students to be able to get actual uh, college credit for a COBOL course uh, the way we used to be able to. Uh, so uh, uh, one of our major projects is a COBOL survey. So we sent it out um, a little over a week ago, and um, I'm just going to give you a snapshot of this. Now, the reason I don't have graphs and everything about this is because I don't want you to think this is any way the final uh, data. Um, is it? Can everybody see my slides? Um, the slide up here. Uh, I thought I shared it. Did I share it successfully? Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I want to be real clear that this 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 data is not official. Um, that that report is going to be given by the body the the, the body, um, and it's going to be out for about another three weeks to a month um, before we uh, are ready to present the data. But uh, this is a snapshot of the data as per. Um, right before this event. So we've gotten 106 responses in. 30% of the companies um, have 5K or more, um, between 5K, 5K and 50K employees. Um, one of the bullet points I didn't put in here, I meant to, 53% um, of the companies were financial institutions. That, that was one of the major points for me. Um, banks, insurance companies, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, I didn't capture that in, that in the slide. I, I put the, put these these bullet points together, you know, during the course of the evening. So, um, you know, it's going to be kind of ragged, but um, fifty percent have more than a hundred thousand employees. So, get, to kind of give you an idea of the of the companies that we're dealing with, um, fifty percent, fifty two percent of the respondents are programmer analysts. Um, excuse my typo there. Um, so I thought that was important. We wanted a, a few more senior managers, but we're getting a lot of program analysts, the folks who actually write the code. Uh, 40%, 43% have 30 or more years of experience. And so one of the things that we noticed was that we need a little more granularity in our questions. Um, there's a trade-off between not trying not to ask too many questions and um, capturing the data that you need. So the next round, we want to get a little more of a, a demographic in terms of, of who these folks are because we want to know when they're going to be retiring. 63% of the companies have 50% or more of the applications in COBOL, which, you know, we kind of expected that, but it's nice to have our data validate that. 61% are fully offshore of the applications are fully offshore. 30% are partially onshore. 77% um, will have their COBOL applications for at least another six years. 60% um, of the companies will have their COBOL applications for more than 10 years. This is the projection of the respondents. You know, it's not like those or anything. This, this, this is not policy, but this is just what they're saying. 45% of the companies are adding co COBOL applications. So this is the, the, the um, um, assumption that there are no new COBOL applications being written is not true. 54% um, of the respondents have either have current staffing problems or expect staffing problems with COBOL. So, um, and there was some confusing data. If you put that together with the, the, the a number of people who have 30 more years in the, in the, in the game, um, they're not really clear about where their new people are gonna come from. Um, I think that it's like 13% say they're gonna get them from either universities or community colleges. That's, you know, 13% of the respondents say they're gonna get them from either um, um, universities or community colleges. However, they said they're gonna get a lot of them from internal training and external sources. Well, we asked the question, if 30% of your, uh, uh, if a lot of your people have 30 or more years in the game, um, where are you gonna get these new people from? You're gonna need new people, right? You're gonna need new people. So we, we thought that was um, a little um, curious, um, but it's very, it's very interesting. And we will be glad to share the data with the world when we, com when we um, complete the review. Um, if you want to participate in the sur survey, please do. It's still ongoing. This is the link for it. Um, and if you want to join our working group, we, we welcome um, new participants. Um, this is the link for it, the COBOL working group. And I think I'm a, a couple minutes past my time. So um, I want to thank you. And I want to thank all the presenters. It, it, this was just excellent. I, I'm, I'm in you know, very esteemed company. So that's, that's all I want to say. Awesome. I knew it was going to be at the end, so I knew it was going to be ugly. So I'm done. I'm done. No, no worries. Thank you so much, Cam. Um, or we'll pause for a moment. We have like another minute here till um, we're at time with the webinar in case anyone has any further questions for our panelists and, and not only the COBOL panelists, but also the ones um, from our earlier sessions. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for your time today in participating in this uh, virtual meetup. Um, we hope to definitely do this here again soon. Um, we really are looking in 2021 here to engage this audience in Japan. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for participating. If you have any further questions, um, Definitely feel free to um, either contact uh, Noyaki, who's based in our Linux Foundation Japan office, um, or any of us here, the staff of the Open Mainframe Project, we're happy to help. Thank you so much, and have a great rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Bye.